as everybody moves in, we're uh, we're very happy tonight. You know, we have a number of lectures during the year, and uh, Gene has has graciously offered to to do a lecture uh, for us tonight. Uh, it's called Travels on the Trail of uh, America's Industrial Heritage. And uh, I know he starts in Coatesville, and I think he travels to New York and Washington, and we'll, we'll hear You'll all see. about it. But we're very excited to have Gene tonight. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, without further ado, this should be very interesting. So Mr. Gene DiOrio. Thank you, Scott. And thank you all for coming in this rather cold weather. The lecture tonight is going to be a little different. Uh, in the past, I've done a lot of these with a specific subject. We're going to Rome, we're going to England, Scotland, and so on. And I've had a lot of questions from people, well, Gene, what do you have in your vast collection of slides? Well, there's over 40,000, and yes, there's a lot of subjects. And it's been suggested to me that why don't you do a, you know, a sort of sampling. So I gave it that thought and decided to do this talk tonight. Now, you're going to 12 different locations. If you don't fall asleep before I get through the whole thing, you'll see 12 different locations. And uh, initially, I thought, well, we'll call this here and there. But uh, it was felt here that I should have some sort of a, um, a program, a theme. So we decided on what has been advertised as a uh, industrial history. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to look at a lot of plants. But we're going to look at things which in some way or another flowed from industry. For example, you're going to see a couple of very grand houses which were the product of industry. Now, in keeping with the biblical maxim that charity should begin at home, I've decided this lecture will begin at home. And the first segment is going to be right here in Coatesville on South First Avenue. I'm dug into my old files to find some things because I know we have a lot of new people uh, in the past few years who are members of our staff or volunteer who haven't seen things. And hopefully this will answer a few questions. So without further ado, we'll get started. Sam, you have this set, I think. Am I out of the way? Well, I said we're going to start on South First Avenue. And the date of this is 1985. Can you all hear me? All right. 1985, Lukens marked the 175th anniversary of its founding in, 2000, or in 1810. So we wanted to get something significant, and I worked with the State Historical Museum Commission. And after some discussion, they agreed to put up a sign, one of the state's historical markers, for Brandywine Mansion. And this is the crew installing it. This was in the summer of 1985. That's about as far as it's going to go. And we felt it was appropriate to put it in front of Brandywine Mansion. And then there's John Ferris, who managed the Lucan store. Uh, he came out to see what was happening. And there you are, John. Okay. If you want to print of that picture, we'll make one for you. <laughs> <laughs> It'll cost you. So there it is. Uh, I remember going through quite a hassle with a state person who reviewed texts of signs. Uh, I was going to describe Brandywine Mansion, and I was going to describe Rebecca Lukens as the mistress of Brandywine. They said, oh, no, 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 can't use that phrase. I said, well, she specializes in boilermakers. But anyway, here it is. We finally worked out wording. Part of the struggles. Well, we had the ceremony for the dedication that afternoon on the lawn of Teresina. Now, Mrs. Stuart Houston had retired to Savannah, but she gave us permission to use the property. So we had it there. The gentleman in the dark suit is Dennis Alco, who was city manager at the time, who was very helpful to us in the initial days of getting established. We had the Lucan's German band and uh, part of the ceremony. Now, we were there on the lawn and I was very nervous because the sky was getting darker and darker. Fortunately, we got through it and got through the unveiling of the sign before we had a major storm. Now, the lady in the first row in the white is, is Jane Davidson. Jane was um, the county's historic preservation director 
And we owe her a great deal. She was enormously interested in this whole project, and she was one of the speakers for the occasion. And I found this picture, Jane is speaking. Jane was very, very instrumental in the next historic event, and that was the designation by the National Park Service of this group of buildings as a National Historic Landmark. Now, that designation was made in 1994. The Park Service presented a plaque. We had a lot of discussion as to where it was going to go. We decided it should go on the ground, not on any building. So here we are putting in cement for the foundation, which is down the street here. This is a part of Greystone's history, and I thought you might enjoy these vignettes. Uh, Richards and Knauer made the stone. I fussed with them. I wanted a piece of stone from Chester County, so we managed to get some black granite, and there it is. I watched the day they brought the stone and very carefully moved it, lifted it, and put it in place. And I asked them, how are you going to get it? Well, they, to my amazement, they put ice cubes over the, under the stone as they were moving it in. And that was the process, they told me, by which they moved the stone in place. The ice, of course, quickly moved, melted, and the stone was placed. But this is the placing of our marker down the street. And there it is. Yes. Now that is the actual marker. Now the, the designation was made in 1994. We didn't do a ceremony until the following year because in 1994 we were celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of Rebecca Lukens. And so we waited until 95. Now on the back of that is another plaque which I arranged uh, designating the site of the Charles Lukens Houston House. And you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. But the house had been there, and um, fortunately we had a set of blueprints, and I was able to get the firm who made the plaque to do this. Well, it poured rain that day that we had the dedication. Uh, we had it under a tent. Uh, Mr. Van Sant, who was president of the company at the time. And Skip, you were making a speech that afternoon. And Senator Santorum, and Congressman uh, Walker, Bob. So we had quite a ceremony despite the, the rain. Now here's two people from our public relations, Chuck Hosick and Kate, who I think just moved in. Good evening. And it was pouring rain, but they, they were public relations for the company and worked very hard to get this ceremony together. Now please understand, some of the properties here, Brandywine Mansion, Greystone Mansion, no, not Brandywine, just Greystone Mansion, Terracina, and the Lucan's Office Building had all been individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places before the National Landmarking, and actually before the Greystone Society existed. Coastville had a historic commission that did all this work, and one by one we got them listed. But then later on, and Jane Davidson, who was on President Bush's Advisory Preservation Committee, worked very hard with the idea of getting the whole group designated as a National Historic Landmark, which in the United States is the top designation, which we got. Well, as part of the ceremony, after the dedication, the rain dropped and we had arranged for a train. There was a railroad group that owned a couple of these Redding diesels and another group that had some cars. And at that time, we were very interested in the idea of developing a tourist railroad along here. But we had this train for the day. So here we are, there's Kate selling tickets or issuing tickets for this train ride. It was a very special thing and thank God the rain stopped although it was still dark. And they boarded right behind the uh, office here. Uh, Gary Shields, who for years managed our railroad operations here at Lukens, was directing much of it. He now owns a big rail complex in Center State. Yeah. 
And there's Skip, our, our foremost railroad enthusiast. <laughs> It was a great trip. <laughs> Skip really loving it all. It was great. Yeah. I don't know who the conductor was. But we went down a few miles into the country. And here's uh, Chuck Hosick, who was really such a joyful person in our public relations and ideal, and who helped pull this whole thing together. Bill and Marilyn Van Zandt. Now, no hissing, please. <laughs> but here we were. And I have to give him credit. Uh, Bill was the one who came up with the idea of creating a museum of the steel industry here. Well, in getting ready for this train trip, a committee of us had a couple of dry runs. We brought the trains up here, ran them down to the country, and it was great, great fun. To my delight, I got to ride in the locomotive on one of the trips. It was fascinating. And so there it is. Uh, I don't know where those diesels have gotten. They belong they're to... They're up in Scranton. Are they in Scranton now? We had hoped that they would stay here, but away they went. So there we are. Well. These are some pictures I took during one of the runs before the actual ceremony. <coughs> and I threw these in because um, some of these buildings are gone now. And this gives you the idea of what it looked like to come up on the train from the south into Coatesville by the plant, and specifically by the 120 mill. This is all history now, but here we are, coming in the back of it. So there. Now most of this is gone. What we're negotiating with Arcelor for is the front part of the mill for our growth of our property here. It was great fun riding these trains. There's what this building looks from the railroad. And of course, uh, under the great bridge of the Amtrak, formerly Pennsylvania Railroad. Yes. One of the trips we had a caboose and it was great fun taking pictures of track out of the caboose. This was taken at the end of one of the trial runs, a group of happy people. There's Chuck and Kate and myself. We had a lot of fun on this. It was really, really great fun. Well, going back to the Charles Lucas Houston house, which I mentioned, I've had numerous, numerous questions about where was it, what was it. So I dug these old pictures out of my file. It stood on the property between this building and Terracina. And it was built about 1895 by Charles Lukens Houston Sr. as his home. And there's the little gazebo. Scott, I remember you liked that so much. Fortunately, I photographed it. You know, Jane, he never used the word senior. He didn't? No. no. The house was uh, part of the district. It was built of gray stone. Uh, CL was the younger brother of AF who built gray stone across the street. The house was not as large or not as grand, but it was certainly part of the district. And it was also designed by Cope and Stewartson, the Philadelphia architects who did both this building and gray stone. That's looking south towards Terracina. Lukens had acquired the property and in 1982 decided to tear it down. The year of the uh, tricentennial when many groups were celebrating history, we marked it by the loss of an important landmark. The wrecker was having a field day selling off paneling, doors, antique, bathroom fixtures and so forth. This was all in the lower hall. I'm glad I took these pictures before the demolition. Um, I used one of the rooms upstairs as an office for Primitive Hall, so was in the building countless times. This is a stained glass window, which was at the landing, which happily got saved. Skip, I think you were particularly like this, and I'm happy to say it's in storage. The Graystone Society owns it. I am, because where it went to was in a bar over in 
Yeah. Well, is that why you wanted it? <laughs> um, a few pictures I took. This was the, the, the mantelpiece in the front parlor, which faced South First Avenue. And that was the metal fireback, Florida de lis Mantelpiece in the upstairs master bedroom. And then upstairs there was a, oh, like a study library with this, which was my favorite of the mantles. And this went to a bar too, uh, down in Kenneth Square. That was where the family had a prayer room. Where they prayed for the company. Oh, really? And um, this was there. And uh, Ted Skiatis' family owned, the, I think it was the Longwood Inn. And this went there. But when that was demolished, I had a call from Ted telling me it was coming down. Do you want it? I said, yeah. So I quick found somebody with a truck and sent a crew down and got it. So we have this mantle, and it is uh, safely stored in our Greystone collections. Now, this was the rear parlor uh, of the house, which faced north, which had this mantelpiece. And what I particularly remember was the brick area between the shelving and the hearth itself. And it had a series of religious figures. Charles Houston and his wife were very dedicated to religious works. And I'm sure they picked these out and it was built in the house. This I'm told is uh, St. John the Baptist, Martha at the well, and the top, this picture, which isn't too clear, of the biblical story of the child leading the lamb. I always admired these. As I told you, I was in the house many times working with Primitive Paul. So I wanted them. The wrecker had sold these to an antique dealer whom I quickly contacted, and he brought them down. Not only did I buy those, but he also got all the little red bricks. They're called encaustic tiles. He got them all. And I got the whole business, and they've been stored since 1982 in my basement. And it's my desire to give these back and have the Greystown Society put them up somewhere. I think it would be a nice tribute to C.L. Houston if we did this. During the years of working with the company and family archives, I went through so much of C.L.'s paper, I developed a great respect for him. Of course, much of his papers are at the Hagley Museum, and I'd love to get these properly placed. So that before, was. Before you go too far, there's one thing that you didn't have in there, but I think it's important. There was a stair landing that went up to the second floor uh, where there was a clock. And my grandfather would always go every day and look at that clock. And if he heard that the mill whistle would go too late or too early, he would call. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yep. Is that the clock we have here? Yep. Uh, no, this is a steam clock. He had a regular clock, I think. One of the family members has in their home now. Okay. But, uh, he would, he would, he would, every, every morning he would go there and open up his pocket watch, and then he'd wait until the, the time came. And then if it was too early or too late with a whistle that they used to have at the plant, he would call up and have it corrected. Not okay. his clock, but theirs. Their clock. <laughs> well, one last Coastville picture. I threw this in. Uh, in the days when the open hearths were operating, we had two bridges across Main Street, which led to the grounds on the north side where we had materials stored, and we had our own implant railroad, and materials would be brought across to the west side of the open hearths, which is where the charging force. So after that closed, they eventually tore the bridges down, and being the company junk man, somebody called and said, Gene, you want these signs? I said, absolutely. <laughs> So I got them, one on each bridge, and you're looking at one of them over that bookcase. So that's another vignette of Lucan's past. So here we are. Watch your coffee there, I don't wanna spill that. Now we're going to another property which has a history of local interests in iron business. We're going to go to Hibernia Park. Now, Hibernia has a distinct connection. Um, we were talking over, over um, a meeting this afternoon how 
The average visitor only sees the house and doesn't understand that this was part of an industrial complex. There was an ironworks there, very well known to Rebecca Lukens. Charles Brook, who was the longtime owner, Iron Master, was extremely helpful to Rebecca during her earlier years. Well, that's the house as it looks now. And this is sort of a year of anniversaries. Um, a few weeks ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the dedication of Hibernia. And uh, as Scott pointed out this afternoon, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Greystone Society. So there been a lot of anniversaries. I dug these out of my file. This will show you what it looked like at the time. Come in. Now these are not pictures I took. These are pictures that um, I got out of our park department files. But it had been deserted for years and it looked pretty wild and woolly when the county took over the property. And there it is. It was closed for a number of years. Fortunately, it wasn't vandalized or burned down. And then the county, after they acquired it in 1963, started to clear the grounds. And that's the furniture, the rags, the house. Someone said it looked like a setting for Edgar Allan Poe's story, and I have to agree, it did. But it was all there, and the county acquired it, and I got involved, and it, this, this is where I cut my teeth, really, on, on working on historic preservation. I didn't even know the house existed when I was on the park board, until I was on the park board, but it was fun. Well, in October of 1964, the park board dedicated the property. And although we had a rather wet day, we had a large turnout for the event, which we held, as you see, in front of the mansion. A few weeks ago on Chester County Day, we had the 50th um, anniversary of the dedication, and I was invited to be a keynote speaker. And it was an emotional experience to be there, to sit on the same porch 50 years later. I'm getting used to these, these um, mementos of my getting old. They're coming faster. The group of dignitaries. And uh, on the left is Maurice Goddard, who was longtime Secretary of Forests and Waters in Pennsylvania through several administrations, who was very enthusiastic about it. The second person is Tom Gothrop, who at the time was President uh, Judge of the County and our keynote speaker. And Everett Henderson was chairman of the park board, and I don't know who the fellow is on the, on the far right. He's a young fellow. Yeah. Well, this was the, uh, the stone, which is still there with the, with the plaque that was put up for the dedication of it. And that's the way it looked on a bright day. Of course, there's a huge tree behind it. You can hardly see it now. Well, despite a dismal day, we had something like 1,500 people stand in line to go through the house after the ceremonies that day. Well, here's another event. Um, in 1982, we were commemorating the tricentennial of the county. So Mrs. John B. Hannum, who was a longtime member of the park board and master of the Cheshire Hunt, cooked up this enormous ceremony. I think she got half of the fox hunting uh, groups in the county to come and participate. We were blessed with a beautiful fall day and one by one, they made their way up the road to the house, led by the Cheshire in their red, red coats. Hunting pigs, I should say. But Nancy put this together superbly. It was quite an event, quite an event. And it shows the beauty of preserving open space and this park. We had quite a crowd turn out for it. And there we are. We also had a lot of carriages come for the event, and they paraded across the grounds on the lawn. This is all in October of 1982. Some of the last slides I have left, I've been presenting many of my Chester County slides to the Chester County Historical Society, and they particularly wanted all my fox hunting pictures, negative slides, I've given just about all of them, in Nancy's memory. Here's another group coming, hounds moving up the road. This took a lot of organizing, uh, which Nancy did. And it was really, really quite an event.
All sorts of carriages turned out. Small ones, large ones. And the parade of horses and hounds across the field. It was all really quite delightful. It takes a bit of doing to handle the harness for four horses. And of course, most of them had their, their uh, liveried servants in the proper period of clothing. Some of them got behind the carriage house behind the mansion. And there they are, jaunting carts to four coach and hands in the proper clothing. Not quite Downton Abbey, Abbey, but there we are. Well, when the parade was over, we had a demonstration of horns blowing for fox hunting. This gentleman did some of them, and Mrs. Hannum did some of them. She was quite expert at that. The other gentleman, I think, is them. There she is, blowing the horn. Now, the other gentleman, I think, is explaining what they are. That's Judge Hannum. Um, it was a federal judge, Mrs. Hannum's husband, with his prize little dog. We had a hound show or a dog show, and that's why he has a number. But the hound was not being very cooperative <laughs> at all. And Mrs. Hannum's looking on to say, come on, John, give him, pu give him a pull. <laughs> and something for the children. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. Well, now, I'm going to close this a little bit. We've had a meeting this afternoon talking about a trail, which early on in my involvement with the park board, we had hoped to build a hiking and biking trail on this line, which was the Wilmington and Northern, which went right through the park. After it was abandoned, uh, we tried and were not successful, but had hoped to build something like the Struble Trail. But I used to love to see the trains coming through Hibernia Park, and there it is. <coughs> I think they were getting ready to put in new ties at the point. Nothing like seeing a caboose coming on. Now this was taken from the porch of Hatfield House. Goes, the tracks go immediately by it. And one of my favorite pictures, if you'll note carefully, there's a flat car with plates from the plant here all neatly wrapped. And you can see, if you look sharply, a little Lucan's tag on them. So that sort of brings that into focus. OK, now we're going to another industrial site. We're going up to see Eckley. Now, Eckley was a coal miner's village here in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was famous for coal. And in the east, we had three major uh, bands or deposits of anthracite. And in the heyday of this, uh, the coal companies would have villages where miners lived close to work. As the industry died, a good many of these got scattered. But this one was one, one village that was held together by uh, private owners. And when Hollywood decided to make a movie on the Molly Maguires, they filmed it here because the village was so very much intact. These are pictures I took a lot of years ago, but here you see these houses, which were built by the coal companies for the uh, workers. They remodeled some of the houses, spruced them up. There were a few old churches. These are older pictures taken the first time I went there. It's been spruced up quite a bit since then. Now, Jim tells me there's a conference center there now, which I haven't seen. But this belongs to the state. Uh, the state acquired it after the uh, movie company moved out. The state acquired this and developed it as an industrial museum site of the coal industry. This had been the, uh, the uh, superintendent's home, obviously larger and grander than the others. Pretty much run down when I saw it. Uh, Tench Cox, C-O-X-E, I believe, was one of the key owners of this. For the movie, they rebuilt the general store and the railroad station, some of the tracks. 
And then also, uh, that's not the mine odor, I was just having a look around. And uh, rebuilt the, uh, the coal collier. You know, the coal was mined and it had to be sorted and so forth. So the movie company rebuilt this thing. Not a complete reproduction, but did well for the movie. So there it is. Hard to believe how active this area was at one time. There were numerous villages of this sort in Pennsylvania in the heyday of our, whole coal, our hard coal um, industry. This is supposed to be the graveyard of Molly McGuire. And these were the people who got into real trouble with labor uprisings, killed some people. And the movie was focused on the history of this union um, uprising. So there's another shot of the village, Eckley. Well worth the trip. Well, after leaving Eckley, I came down over, I believe it's called Buck Mountain, towards Jim Thorpe, which I had never been to. It was a beautiful country up there. It's uh, uh, Luzerne and later into Carbon County. You know, we really have a beautiful state here with beautiful country scenery. Now, the first time I walked in Jim Thorpe, I was depressed. I thought, what a depressed community. And of course it was. Uh, Jim Thorpe was an industrial community, not a mining town per se, but a business community uh, close to where the mines were. And my first time there, I hiked around and I was, <coughs> just thought it was so dismal. There was a nondescript diner, which was the only place I could find to eat. I took one look and decided I wasn't really hungry. <laughs> Found my way to a news uh, shop where I could get a pack of crackers and a Coke. But the more I looked, the more impressed I was. You know, poverty and depression is very often a factor in historic preservation in that um, things get preserved. If this had been a bustling town, a lot of this 19th century architecture would have been gone. But it's been preserved. When was this, Jane? Oh, this was heavens. I should have looked at the date. I'm in the 70s, a long time ago. But it became an inspiration for me because later on, this town has gone through a definite renaissance. Major tourist attraction now. Totally different. Not too far from Philadelphia, not too far from New York, close to the ski resorts. And as I hiked around, I thought, this is like a stage set. It hasn't changed. It's all this 19th century architecture. The uh, old courthouse is downtown. And we'll change the reel here. Very typical 19th century buildings from a profitable time. This, I think, had been a small hotel. And a major building uh, was this brick structure, which I'm told had been the office building for the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company. Now, as the whole business of coal grew, how did you market this? Well, initially, it was canal boats down the river, and then later on, of course, the railroad. This fantastic old building with these 19th century um, uh, terracotta designs happily survived. The last time I was there, I heard that it was made into senior housing, but it has survived right downtown, major attraction. As a strong devotee of historic preservation, um, I've always admired communities that have kept their landmarks because in time it becomes a symbol and a very important thing. Of course, the town was called Mok Chunk originally, which I'm told is an Indian word which means Bear Mountain. You can see how dirty the place was, but Mok Chunk was the original name. Later on, it became Jim Thorpe, and I'll talk about that a little later. Across the street is the courthouse. And uh, the film, the movie has a trial of the Molly McGars, and it is, was filmed in here. 
After this first visit, I talked to a friend who used to live in the area, and she said, oh, Gene, you went on a bad time. You didn't see everything. I was a super person. I was in the, the gallery when we did the, uh, an extra when we did the movie. So she took me back one time and gave me quite a, quite a tour. So gradually, I got to appreciate this place more and more. <clears throat> the county prison where the Molly Maguires were imprisoned and one of the favorite stories of Jim Thorpe is that one of the people who was condemned to death put his hand on the wall and he said, if I am guilty, which I, I'm not, I'm innocent, may God leave my handprint there forever. And now my friend took, we talked our way into the jail, it wasn't a museum then, <laughs> but we got into the jail and we saw the cell and yes, there was a mark, whether it's real or not, I don't know, but it makes a major tourist attraction. <laughs> Well, it's nestled in a valley, and there is this wonderful church, St. Mark's, Episcopal Church. Uh, I think they should call it St. Peter's because it's really built on a rock, but it's a splendid piece of 19th century Gothic. Uh, some of the windows are Tiffany, and the fittings inside are really very, very handsome. I remember one Tiffany window showing Christ as a young man, 12, 14, so beautifully done that you can almost see the knee uh, in, under the gown. It's really beautifully done. Well, the big attraction is this house called the Packer Mansion. Asa Packer. Now, that's the big name. Asa Packer was a poor boy with a lot of brains and a lot of talent who got into various businesses and so forth, but eventually saw a future in coal. And he was working with a canal company but he also saw a lot in railroads. And he started a small railroad with no money, the stock was worthless, but he eventually developed it into the Lehigh Valley Railroad. And Asa Packer is the founder. And this was his home. He became one of the wealthiest men in Pennsylvania in his time. And he built this house, as you can see on the top of the hill, the commanding view of the valley. And he could look out and see his railroad, which was on the other side of the creek. Uh, Asa Packer lived there until he died, I think somewhere in the mm, late 1870s. Among other things, he was in Congress, he was in the state, he ran for governor one time, and he's regarded as the founder of Lehigh University. So a very important figure. Uh, his one daughter, Mary Packer Cummins, preserved the house and willed it to the borough of Mokchunk and it is still owned by the borough. I think one of the local clubs, one of the local service clubs managed it. And she left all the contents, so the house is intact. Uh, the second trip there, I got to see it, and this was before Greystone got started. And this was an inspiration to me to see how important it was for us to save Terracina. The Terracina could indeed become a catalyst for tourism, which this house is. It was the only reason I thought of going to Jim Thorpe, but it has grown. Now up the hill is another house that was built in the 1870s for Harry Packer, who was Asa Packer's son. This is a Victorian extravaganza, but it's uh, full of beautiful woodwork and fittings. The last time I was there, it had become a bed and breakfast, and I assume it's still serving that way. So there were the two houses of the family together, Asa and his, and his son. Very elaborate Victorian. High style now. Well now, the story of Jim Thorpe. Why did it become Jim Thorpe? Jim Thorpe, as you probably know, was one of the world's most famous athletes. Uh, in many different sports, he triumphed in the Olympics. And he came from Oklahoma the Indian uh, territory in the West. And after his death, um, his widow was not happy with his being buried in his homeland. And she was really looking for some place to have a more elaborate memorial. She talked to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, because he went to the Carlisle Indian School and they, they wouldn't do it. Well, Jim Thorpe was, or Mokchunk was really in hard, depressed times and um, the city or borough council said, let's talk to this woman, you know, the brilliance of borough councils. So they talked to her and um, she agreed 
that uh, he would be buried here. Conditions were they had to change the name to Jim Thorpe, which they agreed. Now, he has no connection with it. He wasn't born there. He didn't live there. Uh, he didn't play any sports there. The indications are he never set foot in the place. But the local politicians thought this would be a tourist thing. So there it is. There's his tomb. And it has all these inscriptions of various sports on it. What amused me was that having gone to all this trouble, you would have thought that they would have placed it in a very prominent place in the middle of town. It would be like if we did it and put it way up on 82 or out in Valley Road. It was not in the center of town at all. But that's the Jim Thorpe there. And of course, track and field was one of his greatest accomplishments. Well, there's a hilltop uh, that's well worth the time to go up there for this panoramic view. There you see the Lehigh River, the main part of the town there. And then there's another part which they call Upper Chunk. There's Upper Chunk and Lower Chunk. <laughs> And it's well worth going up there. Now, in the days of the coal operation, there was an incline railroad that ran to the top of the mountain, which for a long time became something of a tourist attraction. In fact, Rebecca Lukens in her memoirs tells about going up there. Brave girl, because in that period it must have been pretty scary, but she did. So we went up there, and uh, they had this top. The little girl there is my boy Kevin's younger sister, and he's on the top. I took the kids up there one time when they were young. But a spectacular place. I don't know if it still operates, but for a while there was a restaurant up there. And one time we were up there and we had dinner overlooking the, the valley. It's really quite spectacular. If you look a little left of center, you can see a white building, which is the Packer Mansion. And the railroad tracks on both sides and a railroad station. Now, as tourism grew up there, there was more and more interest of this scenic beauty. And there is a tourist railroad operation up along the creek. And the old railroad station uh, was preserved and became a tourist attraction. So I don't know how often they run these trains, but here they are. I was up there one time when they were a uh, short distance down the, down the Lehigh Valley. <coughs> Nothing like a steam engine to bring back the past. <laughs> well, at one time before it was all gone, the Reading Railroad used to operate steam engines, rambles they called them. And a few times they came through Coatesville here, uh, and they were great fun to see. So there we are, Jim Thorpe. Mock Chunk. Some people think the name should be restored, and there's great fighting, and of course there are still some of Thorpe's descendants who still want his body taken back to Oklahoma. It's still a fuss. So there's the river and there's the town. And uh, you can see to the left there the spire of the church and in the center of the church. It's really an interesting place, very interesting. Well, now we're going to site another site. See, before you leave there, yeah. one of the things we were told when we were on the train too, that they did barge the coal. But someone, I think on the train, said that they used to dam up uh, in the summer months when it rained so that the barges could float. Because when we were on the train a couple of weeks ago... This train? Well, no, I'm talking about the Manchon. Okay. And the thing that was amazing, it was all rapids. We were trying to figure out how in the world did they have coal barges go up and down the, the rapids. So they, had um, to dam one, they might have dammed it someplace, or, uh, Skip, it could be that um, uh, they built a canal alongside the river. Mm -hmm. That was done, too. Build a canal alongside the river. Yeah. They do a lot of whitewater rafting uh, in Jim Thorpe. There's uh, camps. I've been there with the Boy Scouts that you camp nearby. They bus you, and you uh, that one picture that you showed that you uh, raft right down through Jim Thorpe. Well, now, yeah. They talk about the dam that they release water a couple times a year to help to, uh, to fill it up. Yeah. To, uh, was. Well, it's a lovely, interesting site, and it has, you know, thanks to they kept a lot of buildings, they've got the atmosphere. The last few times I've been there, which hasn't been terribly recently, there's shops, there's bed and breakfast, there's, you know, it, it is a classic example of, of historic preservation working very hard for tourism. Well, now we're going to another site. Uh, a friend of mine who was a very, very keen gardener talked me into going with him to Long Island to 
Westbury to see Old Westbury Gardens. So we were up at dawn and here we are crossing the um, Verrazano Bridge to get out to Long Island. And here we are. Are you aware that the uh, steel cables uh, for the Verrazano Bridge are made where the, the cable anchors? Yeah, made here at the I knew that, yeah. They're, um, what do you call them? There's a word for those. Um, we made them here, you're right. Um, there's, a, there's a name for those particular things. They anchor the cables. Anyway, the purpose of this trip was to go to Westbury to see this great house and its gardens. Now you're going to say, Gene, how does this tie in with industrial history? Well, this is a product of the steel industry. There was a young man in the mid-19th century named Henry or Harry Phipps, P-H-I-P-P-S. Pittsburgh, his father made shoes. He was a cobbler, they were very poor. And in the same neighborhood where they settled was another poor young man named Andrew Carnegie. They became very close friends, started a business, and as Andy got more and more into the iron, Phipps was in his partnership. Worked out real well. Uh, as the Carnegie Steel Group uh, got bigger and bigger, so did Mr. Phipps got wealthier and wealthier. He was a bright young boy with a lot of brains for accounting and finance, and he and Carnegie became partners. And along with another Pittsburgh name, Henry Clay Frick. And when Andy sold his business to J.P. Morgan in 1901 for 450, Mr. Phipps, uh, I believe, was the largest shareholder after Andy. Walked away with 40 or 50 million of spendable dollars in 91. So along with Andy and Henry Clay Fripp, all three of them shook the dust of Pittsburgh from their shoes, or maybe I should say their golden slippers, and moved to New York. And all three of them built sumptuous palatial houses on Upper Fifth Avenue. Carnegie's and Frick's have survived as museums. Uh, the Phipps Mansion was also on Fifth Avenue, about 80-something street. But uh, after Mr. Phipps died, his wife wasn't too happy with the place. In about 1930, she sold it to developers, so it is gone. However, their son, Jay Phipps, built this house out on Long Island. Georgian-style architecture. Gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. The architect's name was Crowley. He was British, who somehow got acquainted with the Phipps. The Phipps, after they made money, traveled extensively, but then as their <coughs> children got to be college age, they should, decided they should settle down. So they built the house in New York. Well, the house was demolished, but this room, which was the dining room, was saved, the paneling and the pieces, and reincorporated by the son in the house at Westbury. This is uh, Nassau County, which is the first county after the Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, the interior is intact, all the fittings, furnishings. These are just a few pictures that I got when I was there. But the main thing is the gardens. We went there primarily to see the gardens, and uh, I was amazed to see the house, which was grand. We had a whole day there. I met the curator who showed us some of the original drawings and so forth, and just had a wonderful time. This is the back of the house, which has this beautiful terrace, which overlooks the grounds. This was built, oh, 1905, 1906, that period. And while the parents gave up the house in New York, uh, Jay and his brothers and sisters all had homes in Long Island. And uh, some years ago, the family did a book. They found a lot of family pictures, and it really is the Gatsby era. They're heavy into horses and polo and the whole bis. So there it is, beautiful brickwork. Terraces, which look down. I understand that the architect also did a lot of the layout of the gardens, working closely with the owner. Uh, but when we were there and met the curator, I think uh, there were other architects who did some of the planning. You often see pictures of this in fashion magazines a very uh, popular place for weddings and fashion pictures. So you contribute this to the steel industry. And uh, this was under the main arch, the statue, I think it's Bacchus. I love statues of Bacchus with the grapes. Yes, this has to be Bacchus. 
long vistas uh, through the gardens. We spent the whole day there from early until it closed that six o'clock, I think, and hiked over it several times. Uh, it was really spectacular. Now, after the older members of the family had passed on and the later generation after the Second World War struggled with what to do with this place, they figured it might go the way of all these grand houses. But it was, the feeling was it was too great. So the family got together, created a nonprofit, and turned this property over. So it is now owned and operated by Old Westbury Gardens, which is a nonprofit corporation established by members of the Phipps family. Initially, they endowed it, and I think, of course, endowments don't always go forever, and they raise money elsewhere. But here it is. Um, when um, New York City's great highway builder was looking at highways through Long Island, he appreciated this place. So if you look at the maps, you'll see that one of the main highways goes around it, not through the property. They did sell off some of the land, some of the polo grounds. So when I said I'm on the trail of the steel industry, <laughs> here we are. Because it was money from Pittsburgh, from the Carnegie Steel plants that made this family wealthy and made this property. It's in this area. When people come and they want to know what to do, I always say go to Hagley first and see where the, the DuPont started. And the other properties, such as Nemours and Longwood, are like this, what I call the flowers on the tree. I love this, this work on this gate. Ponds, vistas. And pools below the house. Of course, over the years they added to it. Not everything was built once at one time. One of the granddaughters um, of the Phipps was quite famous as a gardener and I think it was because of her influence that the family really did work to hold this together. <clears throat> Full of beautiful vistas, small ponds, fountains, and one of my favorite pictures uh, this uh, gazebo overlooking the pond back to the house. I love this picture, it was one of my favorites when I was going through this collection to dig this out for you this evening. So there it is. And from the main south side of the house, there's this long green alley toward this ornamental gate. And there it is. I love ornamental gate work. So there it is this classic vista. Georgian formality of the house and very formal gardens that offset it. It's beautifully done, really. So with that in mind, I and my friend got back in the car early evening, back across the Triborough Bridge. So. Now you're gonna look at something very, very different. I hope the gardens have relaxed you. We're going to New York, down to the site of 9-11. Now we took a group of our members to New York recently to see the 9-11 Museum. <coughs> and having seen this, I thought you might enjoy seeing these pictures. Uh, as you know, the Greystone Society, we successfully negotiated with the Port Authority of New York to get the trees. We brought them back here in April of 2010. So with that in mind, uh, we wanted to see what New York was doing in museum planning. So we were invited over and a team of us, Scott and I, and Al Giantonio, our engineer, and Peter, Peter Saylor, our, our architect, we went over. And we were received very nicely by the uh, museum people. These pictures were taken from the window of their office, which was up on Liberty Place. looking down on the site. And in the foreground, you can see the museum building coming under sh uh, uh, shape. And there it is. I'm so glad we did this because now I see it and it's, it's in, increasingly interesting. 
Well, there's our team. That's Peter Saylor and Scott and Al. All looking cold. It was a cold winter day in December. <laughs> and there we are. When was that team member? This was in December of 2010. Mm. Yes. Uh, there's the, the new tower and the construction, which uh, I think I took that I took that from the window of the office. Yes. And there you see it. These are historic pictures now. I'm glad I, I took them when yeah. we we're over. Yeah. Well, we were taken down to the actual site by our host from the museum uh, and had a great fun hiking around looking at this. Is that you laying table team? No, it's not. No, it's not. Maybe tripping over it. We were standing there listening to the lady in the hat. She was our guide. Um, I can't think of her name. Do you remember, Scott? She hosted us through it. So there's the museum building, which those of us who were on the tour saw under construction. This is now the 9-11 Museum building in New York. And particularly interesting to us was two of the trees, which they put in first and built around. And here they were, all wrapped up. And now you see them, they're all open, you can see them. But here they are. This is what we got to see uh, within the structure of the new museum our two trees, which are so significant to us since they were made here at Lucan's. This is amazing. Having worked here at Lucan's, I remember when these things were made and how act, uh, proud we were because it was a very visible use of our steel and, and it came to this historic thing, but here they are. There's our group standing in front of the tree and that part of the building was finished. There's Scott supervising it. <laughs> Take lunch, guys. I think they, I think they did. <laughs> <laughs> and yours truly. Now this is all filled in now, but now you've seen the pools. The enormous amount of excavation was done on this site for the pools and for the whole business and the wall they had to build to keep the water out of this. And I took some of these as we were hiking around. Now I dug into my files of some of the pictures I took. We had several trips to the airport when we were negotiating. Just to show you some of the things we looked at. These piles of tangled steel, which were there. And one of the things that excited me so much, and this was one of them, they have these suspended on the wall, what they claim is steel from the impact when the plane, where the plane hit. These were all there uh, in the hangar, which we toured and saw them. And this, which is in their special history section, um, this fascinated me. This, we were told, was four floors compressed. And you can see bits of carbon and bits of steel. And this, uh, we, one of the most memorable things in, in the uh, hangar. And it's on the exhibit there, you can see it. One of the things that we saw was a piece of the Wall Street Journal and the date hanging out from the center. Yeah. It had to be four floors that collapsed on the paper. And the paper was still there. Yeah, and yeah. Well, it's carbonized, it's still yeah. Carbonized, yeah. Well, the Port Authority kept a lot of things, as Scott will attest, we saw tons and tons of material. And on a more humble basis, these, these notes, people were posting notes all over New York. Have you seen my mother, my brother, whoever? And some of this is on display. And of course, the end of one of our trees as they looked in the hangar. And I took this picture uh, when it was agreed that we were going to get them. Uh, the Port Authority people very nicely labeled it that this is for the Greystone Society and the National Iron Steel Museum. 
Now, one of the uh, key exhibit items is what is known as the last column. It was in the South Tower, which was heavily signed uh, by members of the fire companies. Uh, this we saw as it was in, in the hangar. And now that's a central, I would say, one of the major, major exhibit items. And I can tell you, and I think I can speak for Scott, that although we had so many trips over there, the horror of this thing never wore off. It never became blasé about it. Um, not at all. Now, Scott's talking to a gentleman named John Ryan, who was a security guy at the uh, JFK, who was just wonderful to us. And I threw this in because I'm going to show you this little souvenir. Those photographs were found in a, in a file in the, which somehow miraculously survived the fire. And the pictures were taken of John and others the day of their graduation from the Police Academy in New York. Oh. So here is his on exhibition with John's pictures. But it's amazing that something like that survived. Didn't he find his picture in the debris pile? I don't know if he found it himself, but it was found. Maybe somebody found it because the, there's a picture of him with the... Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is from his, the, the, the uh, little sign indicates that this came from that. So, well, now we're going to stay in New York, and we're going to go uptown a bit, cross the Throgs Next Bridge, to go into the Bronx and see pictures of Fort Schuyler. Now, in the days when there was concern of invasion of New York, uh, several forts were built along the various waterfronts. One was one called Fort Schuyler. And it's on a peninsula called Throgs Neck, which jets out into the East River. It sort of divides the East River and the Long Island Sound. We brought the trees back over this bridge uh, when it was worked out with the Port Authority and the police. Uh, there was some problem. We couldn't bring them over, over the Verrazzano. So they brought them through Queens and over this bridge and then into the Bronx and then to the Triborough and eventually onto the George Washington. But this is built over this fort. Now, I have to thank my good friend Herman Wolfrey, who I hope to be here this evening, uh, whose son was attending a school here. Uh, under this bridge and in this fort is the uh, Maritime Academy of the State of New York, SUNY, S-U-N-Y, the State University of New York. And his son was attending it, and he said, Gene, you have to come up here with me sometime because they have a museum of ships and maritime history. So I've been up there a couple of times. This is a fort, fantastic heavy stone, built to defend the city. I don't know that it ever had a fire or shot in defense, but there it is. And the building itself is used for offices, for classrooms, and for this museum. That's Herman and his son, Herman Jr., who I believe has graduated now and is planning a career in the Merchant Marine. But the interior of this building on two levels is this fantastic museum of ships. Uh, an absolute must, I'd say, and I was so happy that Herman insisted on my going up there. This was a scale model of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is now largely gone, I believe. And to my delight, it was filled with beautiful models of ship. This is the United States, the one that we have a model here. And there was a great deal of paraphernalia <coughs> about the United States. And then uh, various lines. This, this, this corner was dedicated to the Cunard Company. And there's a model of the first Queen Elizabeth and some other uh, ships of the line. This is a very handsome painting of the Leviathan. Now, this, has, this connects with our Newport News shipbuilding group. The Leviathan was a German ship built just before the First World War, a period when the Germans were in hot competition with the British, and the same period the British were building the Titanic and other great liners. Uh, the Germans were building a series of equally large ships. In fact, they were bigger than the Titanic. The Leviathan was called the Vaterland. She came out in the early point of 1914. It was in New York uh, when the First World War 
broke out in the August of 14, and that's another anniversary coming up this year, the 100th anniversary. So the Germans decided to leave it in New York for safety. It's only gonna last a few months. Well, the war dragged on for years. And when we got into it, the United States seized this ship uh, along with other German ships in American ports. We didn't have a lot of big transports. Faced with the need of taking thousands of American soldiers to France, this ship was renamed the Leviathan. Uh, I understand President Wilson declined having it named for him and his wife came up with this name Leviathan, the biblical name Monster of the Deep. So Leviathan she became, and she became one of our chief, chief transports of uh, soldiers to France, much to the chagrin of the Germans, of course. And when the war was over, she brought uh, American soldiers home. After the war, we decided to keep it. It was sent down to Newport News, to the shipbuilding company there, to revitalize it and restore it as a luxury passenger ship, which it was. And it kept Newport going, because after the war was over and the military orders dropped, they were hard pressed for a while. And this kept the shipyard going. So that's the Leviathan. She was never quite the success that some, they expected her to be. Unfortunately, she was operating under American flag and American rules in the 1920s, which was the era of national prohibition, and the ship was dry. So Americans were happily trooping off to Europe on foreign flag vessels. Well, this was the chapel with the uh, anchor on the altar and a very nice stained glass commemorating that. Well, on the grounds of the uh, Sony, uh, SUNY Museum is one of the propellers from said United States. This gives you an idea of how huge they were. This commemorates one of the captains who, who uh, did that, uh, commanded the United States. And that plaque tells you the history of the ship, having built Newport News, shipbuilding, and so forth. Now, these things are enormous. It looks like a modern sculpture, which they really are. Um, recently, I think they were going to, they started to sell off some of these. When I went through the United States a couple of summers ago in Philadelphia, they had them on the back deck. And I understand one of them was being sold because they were getting very hard up for cash. There's yours truly, that gives you a scale of how large these propellers were. She had four. And everywhere you look, you're under this bridge can't avoid it. Well, they have a training ship. And while I was there the first time, Herman's son took me on a tour of the ship. And in the summer, they would go off on extended cruises as part of their training. Looking towards the bridge. There's Herman and his dad on the bridge. Uh, I think the ship was called the Empire State, which, of course, is what New York is called. It was interesting to go through it looking down the river. The bridge in the far distance is the Bronx Whitestone Bridge, which we were going to bring the trees across, but it was under some repairs, and that's why we brought them over the Throg's Neck instead and bring them home. So wherever you go, you are under this bridge, but the school nestles under it very comfortably. Well, now we're going to another site which owes its existence to industrial success. We're moving into the Hudson Valley and to the west bank of the Hudson, but not on the river, but back further in what is known as the Ramapo Mountains. And on a long country drive, I went to see a great estate. We're approaching here. This is called Arden. A-R-D-E-N. And this was the country home of one of America's most famous railroad people, Edward H. Harriman. Another poor boy who made quite good with railroads. And as his fortune grew, uh, he bought a lot of land in this area, eventually owned something like 30 or 40,000 acres, and decided to build a great country home. And for this purpose, he employed a very prominent New York architectural firm, Carrere and Hastings. 
I understand he talked to various architectural firms who came up with various ideas, but he wanted something that was looked American, very solid stone for this mountain area, nothing fussy. So here it is. Um, the name Arden came from a family who had previously owned the land. And um, I think they just liked the name too. It reminded me, it reminded them of uh, Shakespeare. So this was a Harriman estate. This was begun in the early 1900s. <coughs> up on a very high hill with large commanding vistas of the countryside. Mr. Harriman unfortunately didn't live to see it totally completed. I think he died about 1909. But he was quite a figure. Wall Street financier. Had interest in railroads. And when the Union Pacific Railroad went into bankruptcy, he bid on it and won. So he got to control the Union Pacific, and later on, the Southern Pacific, and the Illinois Central, and a few others. Yeah, the railroad coaches that uh, carried his name, the Harriman coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was interested in seeing this house, being interested in Carrera and Hastings, and one time I was visiting up there, and got to see the property. Um, the Harriman family uh, used this house until about the time of the Second World War. It was entirely huge and expensive. So Mr. Harriman's son, Avril Harriman, who was later governor of New York, uh, allowed the Navy, turned it over to the Navy, and it was used during the Second World War as a convalescent home. So hundreds of, of uh, naval people used this place in the country as convalescents. Really quite a spectacular place. So when the war was over, what to do with it? Well, Avril Harriman, of course, had been in the State Department, went to Yalda with Roosevelt, had gotten acquainted with uh, Eisenhower. And when the war was over, and Eisenhower, before he became president, was president for some time at Columbia University in New York. So having gotten well acquainted with him, Avril Harriman worked with Ike. Ike wanted to put together an international study committee, came up with the idea of making this property available for that. So Ike agreed, and the property was turned over to Columbia University, who used it for a number of years for various high-level conferences. And that was the purpose of it when I, was, when I toured the place. Now, happily, uh, the connection that I got to into it was because Mrs. Hannum, who was our fox hunting lady and our park board comrade. She was a granddaughter of Edward Harriman. And, and so she made the necessary contacts for me. And I went up there and uh, had all kinds of clearance and hiked all over the house and all over the grounds. Now, Columbia gave it up a few years ago. And I understand there is a real question now of its future. It's being held for by some conservation group. Now, the Harrimans gave up most of, the, most of the estate many years ago to New York. Uh, the Palisades Parkway includes a great deal of land called Harriman State Park, and that was gifted by the Harriman family to the state of New York. Recently, it's been in the news a bit because uh, some group wants to put a, a casino near the railroad station there. And it happens that the uh, Harrimans had given land to, well, what was then the Erie Railroad, now part of Conrail, or now part of Norfolk Southern, something like 100 acres specifically for railroad purposes. And this casino group wants that land for the casino. And some of the Harriman family who were very interested in land conservation said, oh, no, no, because when this was given, it was given with a caveat that the land can only be used for railroad purposes. And if it's not used for railroad purposes, it'll revert to the family. It's a big fuss. The New York Times had an article on it about a month ago. So I don't know where it's all going to go. But this is Arden House. And as I said, it was designed by Carrere and Hastings. Now, they were very, very prominent grand architects of the so-called Gilded Age. I would say their most prominent building is the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue. They did the amphitheater, the auditorium at um, Arlington the approaches to the bridges, and a good many grand houses, among them Frick's House, which is now the Frick Museum in New York, and also very close to us in Wilmington, the Alfred DuPont Estate in Namur. 
And they did a great deal of these great houses of that period. Little statue. Um, Nancy Hannum told me that this statue was a source of humor to her and her cousins and sisters. They called it, Who's Got the Soap? <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I hope something, some good use comes of this property. I've heard some thought that some group might make it into a resort of some sort, but it is very handsome. <clears throat> The tower, uh, I took the time to go, it was a beautiful day that I was there, to go to the top of it to see these colossal views across the, uh, the countryside. Yes, there was a railing, so I was comfortable. That looks down on the roof. I understand the roof was originally slate, but was replaced with this uh, tiering. But the views are just beautiful. And yes, it would make a great country resort. But I hope something very, uh, you know, very useful comes to it. Well, now we're going to go from the bright sunshine of State Park to the dark depths of 30th Street Station. We're going to take a train ride. Can I take a break and get another glass of water? Can you hold on just a minute? Be right with you. If I don't trip over the wire. Thank you. Well, look who's here, sleeping. Can you see? All right. I see it, thank you. I see it, thank you. All right, we're in the depths of 30th Street Station getting ready to take a train ride out to uh, Pittsburgh. Now, I have to express thanks to our board member who isn't here this evening, Al Giantonio, who is gung-ho deep into railroads, president of the Friends Group, and he knows this gentleman in the Philadelphia area who has his own private railroad equipment, Bennett Levin. So from time to time, he offers a trip. So on this particular trip, he was attaching his two private cars to the back end of the Pennsylvania, which is Amtrak's train from New York, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh. Would you like to go along and ride in this private car? Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any good pictures of the car. It was dark there. None of the stops were long enough to get out and take pictures, but to ride the back of this thing and get this great look at the tracks. Now, for those of you who are not railroad enthusiasts, this is probably madness, but for those of you who like to look at railroad tracks, and viewing it from the back of this car was absolutely fascinating. Whipping along at, at high speeds, this is about gap, the curves. You know, you just don't quite get the feel of the line when you're sitting on the side and looking out. One of the things you ought to point out here, too, is all those ties, those wooden ties, are now replaced by concrete. They are. You can imagine what one of those costs and how many millions of those that they've used to do both sides of the railroad. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, they want a faster trip. This was Gap. And here we are where the Strasburg Railroad comes out to the main line and backs and turns. We shot this here. We had a beautiful day for the trip. And this was at the uh, station in Lancaster. And as you can see, they've taken up some of the tracks. There used to be many more tracks in these stations. Lancaster has a very nice station. I understand it's been updated a bit. Largely two tracks farther up the line as we uh, went to Harrisburg. Well, now, the real thrill, uh, Mr. Levin didn't like people sitting in that back porch, as I call it. The railing wasn't that high. The train's good in uh, good, good speed. For those of us who were on it, a few of it for the first time, he said, OK, you can be there. So at Altoona, I and about three other people got on the back porch. 
Now you talk about a thrill for a railroader. Uh, being on the back porch in the open air, riding up the horseshoe curve. This was a thrill. And uh, so here we are. That used to be four tracks too. I think uh, Conrail took up one of the tracks. There's only three now. But this was the thrill of a railroad fan to, to be able to stand out in that back porch, holding onto the rail, because we were speeding, uh, <laughs> to get up to uh, the- Those two engines were helper engines. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they always have them there at the curve, yeah. So there we are. Now, this is part of America's railroad history. Uh, the building of the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, was initially chartered from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh. And uh, J. Edgar Thompson, who was the grand engineer, who laid out much of the route, including this uh, horseshoe curve. This was a thrill among thrills. And I stayed on the, uh, the porch until we got beyond Galitzin. These are the tunnels when you come out of Galitzin, a little town there. Well, <clears throat> we, uh, this train gets into Pittsburgh at night this awful connection that Amtrak has. If you want to go to Chicago from here, you ride this, you get to uh, Pittsburgh around eight at night, and you have to wait for this train that comes up from Washington. If it's on time, you, you might have two or three hours sitting in the station. The Cardinal, I think that's what they call it. Terrible. Well, and then when we, we were there two nights in a hotel, and then on um, Monday we came back, and we had to be at the station because it leaves like 7.30 in the morning. So it was dark then too. Here's Al, Al Giantonio, and yours truly. Now I've always learned in Sunday school that envy is a sin, but I'd love to have a private railroad car. <laughs> <laughs> if I was rich as heaven, I wouldn't want a private plane, but a railroad car, yeah. And that's the back porch of this car. This car was once a car uh, used by a president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Mr. Levin had it completely modernized and meet all the modern rail conditions. And it was just great. This is coming east that morning. Uh, this, I believe, is through Johnstown. I was clicking pictures. This is not all of the photographs by any means, but a good sampling. Johnstown, once the home of Cambria Ironworks and one of Bethlehem's plants, now pretty well closed up, I guess. But speeding along and, you know, just looking at this was just a thrill. Well, this is a uh, Hershey curve coming east. That was your engine. Huh? That was your engine at the lead. Yeah. There we are. That's where uh, there's a little uh, museum there. Uh, at one time, there was a K-4 planted there, uh, and that has, was taken off because the Allegheny winters were deteriorating. Uh, I haven't been there since then, but I understand there's a little incline railroad that goes up to that height and you can track. Incidentally, Mr. Harriman had an incline railroad to get up to his house. It's now gone. I think it was scrapped for scrap steel in the Second World War, but that's the way they got up there with his own private little railroad. When he commuted into New York, the rail line along there was the Erie, and I understand he just cussed it to no end because it was not as well managed as his own railroads. <laughs> the Altoona uh, water uh, works are there in the, in the curve, and that's looking back uh, the upper level. You know, everybody asked why the curve. Well, the curve was to get the grade. And to build a bridge across there would have been enormously costly and difficult in the 1850s. But with this masterpiece of railroad engineering, Mr. Thompson got up the mountain and got it at a dignified grade that was easier to operate. So it's really an industrial landmark. So we're whipping along. Great to be so close to all these passing freights. Now this was in Altoona, uh, the, I think it's called the Railroad Veterans have a museum in Altoona with a few cars. I haven't been out there for some years, I don't know how well they're doing. 
Um, that elaborate car was, I understood, the private car of Charles Schwab, who established Bethlehem Steel Corporation and who lived in a very grand manner. Some years ago, someone set fire to that car and they've been slowly restoring it. But I'm told that's, that's the car as it stands now. Whipping along east, just great the view from the back of this train. A lot of celebrities have traveled. When Prince Charles came here a few years ago, he and his wife, uh, Camilla, were taken back to New York on this train. Bobby Kennedy's body was taken from New York to Washington for the funeral services in this train. They had to take windows out to get the casket, he told us, on board. This is uh, Huntington Station. Again, we had beautiful weather coming back. Well, we're coming east at good speed, and we're uh, uh, going over the Rockville Bridge, I believe, uh, north of Harrisburg. Yes, I think this is Duncannon, this area. Yes. Just some interior pictures. Uh, this is the dining room of the car. Now, he had a second car called Warrior Ridge which was sort of a parlor car and dining car, and much of the food service was there. But because Al knows Mr. Levin, we, were, we had dinner going out to Pittsburgh in this room with, with the Levins. It was great fun to, uh, to have this private dining room. <laughs> the car door in the train and in the uh, sleeping car, in this observation car. There's a happy group of railroaders, there's Al. And another happy railroader, enjoying it all. find the right spot here. Nope. Okay, that's Mr. Levin and uh, his son who was with us on the trip. And uh, we were laughing at something. I think maybe he was wondering how did I get all these people in my car, but of course we did. And his wife, who did much of the food serving, and she was absolutely delightful. This was a wonderful trip. I'm glad I did it. And there he is again. But he has this collection of private cars. I think he bought Conrail's business set. And his wife again. She was just lovely. There's Al looking very happy. And there's a very happy traveler. <laughs> Amtrak will never be the same. <laughs> I mean, riding this solid old Pullman car. Now, if nobody here, if nobody here uh, should fail to recognize this scene. So there we are in coming into Coatesville. Now, we were talking today about the importance of keeping open business. And one of the things I'm hoping for when we get to the point of erecting our trees, they will be visible, clearly visible from the railroad. No question about it. This is coming across the high bridge into Coatesville. And there it is. Well, we whipped along the main line. I think this is Berwyn. And that, I believe, is the curve as you approach Berwyn. I took other pictures. This is a good sampling of the stations. We moved at a pretty, pretty good pace on this trip. <clears throat> so the end of the trip, there's Al and his wife, Tina, where we were at 30th Street Station. Coming down in the world, the board septa come back to Thorndale. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great trip. Now, we got out there on a Saturday evening left on Monday morning, so we had Sunday. 
So Sunday was largely spent at this estate called Clayton. Now this ties in, Clayton was the Pittsburgh home of, you guessed it, Mr. Frick, Henry Clay Frick. And we had a very pleasant time. This is his home, which is called Clayton. We uh, spent the day there. Uh, Mr. Frick moved to New York and built his palatial home on Fifth Avenue. But his daughter, Helen Clay Frick, lived here, loved it, and this was her home the rest of her life. Happily, she endowed it, and it is now a well-endowed operating museum. Now, this house was a smaller house. Mr. Uh, Frick bought it, enlarged it, remodeled it. Uh, I wasn't thrilled with it. To me, it was an architectural hodgepodge. No way is as good as our Greystone Mansion, in my feeling, because it's a pure example of its style. The interior, however, is quite magnificent. Paneling, paintings, elegant furniture. Uh, when the Fricks moved to New York and built the big house on Fifth Avenue, this was left behind with his daughter. It was Victorian. But it's all very well maintained, and the day we spent, we had good weather, and we had a wonderful guide and went through room by room of this house. But this was Mr. Frick's Pittsburgh home. Some nice gardens in the area. Clayton. Henry Clay Frick's uh, home skip. The inside was quite impressive. Now on the grounds, an old building, well, maybe it was a carriage house, I don't know, was made into a restaurant. And it was lovely. And we had made reservations here, and we had our Sunday leisurely luncheon here. Beautifully done. And of course, it turned my wheels thinking about the possibilities of our Greystone carriage house. This building was nowhere near as nice or architecturally as important, but it's on this well uh, state and a good neighborhood in Pittsburgh. So there it is. Nice greenhouse on the property. And Miss Frick had kept developing it. And there was a museum devoted to vehicles, carriages, and some early automobiles. Now, this is quite a fancy buggy. It belonged to Miss Frick. You can imagine people staring when that was, <laughs> when she was tooling around Pittsburgh in that little number. Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's a Packard, but I'm sure. Not sure. Well, there it is. And this looked like straight out of Gatsby. And there I am, I had a picture taken next to it. Al, Al was busy taking pictures. Quite a piece of equipment, straight out of Gatsby. Uh, when we, we had to make reservations for the tour, this little house became, I think it was a tenant house, was where they had the ticket reservations, a small shop and so forth. Lovely gardens on the property. Miss Frick had um, salvaged this series of columns from another Frick estate. I think it was in the shore somewhere. It was demolished. And she salvaged these columns and brought them here. She also built an art gallery on the property. There's quite a bit of land here. And she had quite a nice collection of paintings and statues in this very Italianate Renaissance art gallery uh, here on the property. Well, now, we're going to go to Missouri. And I've told you it would be Pennsylvania, New York, and Missouri. Now, what took Jean to Missouri? It wasn't a resort. This goes back to 1979 when I was doing my Chester County Traveler's Album book. And I needed to find a publisher to do the publishing and binding and so forth. And they were in a small town in north central Missouri 
called Marceline. Okay, I'm going to have to go to Missouri. How do I get there? Well, to my delight, I found that it was on the main line of the Santa Fe Railroad. And even better, it was a divisional stop, so the train stopped. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I backed that off, I think. Uh, I took the Broadway Limited from Paoli out to Chicago. Well, Amtrak trying to piece things together at that point wasn't quite directed. And they had two sections of the Broadway, one from New York and then another section that came up from Washington and they joined it at Harrisburg. So well, I got there and I got out while we waited for the train, the section to come up from Washington and be attached to it. So there we are. One of the last of the GG runs. You can tell how old these pictures are. It was 1979 when I went out there. And here they are moving the other cars in place, the Harrisburg station. Well, at least you could still get there. Got to Chicago in the morning. My train west wasn't until late afternoon. So what do you do when you have a layover, which I've had several times on westbound trips in Chicago? Well, I always liked the city. This is Michigan Avenue, the Prudential Insurance Building. And a um, wonderful restaurant, which I guess is still there. But two of the things that I always found the way to kill a day in Chicago while you're waiting for a westbound train, one was to go to the um, Chicago Art Institute, which is right there on Michigan Avenue, uh, guarded by these pair of wonderful bronze lions. Great collection of artwork, and I enjoyed it very much. So I would go there and enjoy that. Or go downtown to Marshall Field and Company, the department store. Now, Marshall Field is a big name in department stores in Chicago, like Wanamaker in Philadelphia. And just as I always regarded Longwood Gardens as the gold standard of gardens whenever I went anywhere else, I always regarded John Wanamaker as the gold standard of department stores. And the only one that ever really was like it was Marshall Field. Great monumental building with two courtyards. Uh, Beautiful store, uh, great merchandise, and like Wanamaker's, very friendly, capable people. I got acquainted with it my first time in Chicago and loved it. And John Wanamaker, when he decided to uh, build his great department store, went to Chicago and engaged the same architects who did the Philadelphia store, uh, who did the Chicago Marshall Field. And like Wanamaker's, it's now, it's now Macy's. The other courtyard has this splendid mosaic, I believe it's Tiffany tile, which I was always very impressed with. Well, okay, on to Marceline, though here we are. Little town in north central Missouri. And this was a very different, <laughs> different world, but that's where the publishing company was. There you see their typical Midwest, it looks like a setting for Sinclair Lewis's novel, Main Street. And this was Walsworth Publishing Company. Now these people were primarily a publisher of high school and college yearbooks. That was the bread and butter of their business. But they were trying to do art books and through some long controverted uh, connections, I got hooked up with them. Um, found out the publishing was much cheaper in the Midwest than in the East. And I was the publisher of my book in that I I arranged for the printing and binding uh, and covered the whole thing. So I spent close to a week out there working with Walsworth people and it was very interesting. Uh, Don Walsworth, whose family owned the business and he was president of the company, was very gracious and I visited with them at their home the parties and got acquainted with a whole different form of life. Now many of you I'm sure have been to Disneyland and Disney World. And when you go into them, there's a sort of pseudo 19th century streetscape. Well, it was Marceline that inspired Disney for it. As I learned when I got out there, Marceline was his boyhood home. I love this. You see in Sun, but at San Daughter, this store. Um, as I hiked around the town, 
Um, I found the local high school was named for Walt Disney. So I found out that, yeah, and this is where he lived. He lived here. He was not born in Marceline. I don't know. Maybe his father worked for the Santa Fe Railroad. I don't know. But anyway, Disney had a great, he grew up here. Now the company provided me with a car, and while I was there, I toured some of the area, mostly farm country. Uh, I would die of boredom in the middle of Missouri. Uh, the big thing there was to hop in the car and drive a couple of hundred miles to Kansas City to go shop or something. But I must say it was a different world and it was educational. But happily, happily, the railroad right through town, which fascinated me. And the trains would stop there because it was a divisional spot. And there was a high bridge that I could look down on the trains and see them going by. Santa Fe Railroad. And as I say, it was a divisional spot, so they changed uh, train crews here. And they would come through the trains once a day, two or three freights. And um, let's see. So when I wasn't busy at the plant, I'd be down along watching the railroad. Walking, talking to the crews. There I am at the Marceline Railroad Station. Now who took that picture? Huh? <laughs> the conductor of the trains? No, uh, one of, <laughs> no, no, Skip. One of, the, one of the staff from the, one of the staff from the publishing company. And of course, people had to wait to get across the road. Now, um, on the edge of town was a, a sort of park with a huge pond, which the railroad had built in the days of steam engines to provide water for the steamers. After we all went to diesel, uh, they gave this to the town, uh, this lake or pond, and it became the focus of a park. But there in the middle of a town is the old, is an old locomotive. A real old one. Santa Fe and Disneyland Railroad. Now one of the uh, chief officials of Walsworth told me that Disney got very, very serious about doing something with his hometown. And he was going to develop something there did not want it publicly known because he knew that real estate values would go through the roof if that happened. So he turned to this gentleman whose name escapes me and had him quietly buying up land. Well, then Disney died. And um, my friend at the company said, you know, I thought I was going to be left holding the bag, but I wasn't. Disney's management people came through and I was reimbursed and the properties got sold. Uh, the house where Disney lived, which he showed me his daughter and son-in-law were living in. But if Disney had not died, Marceline might have become a Midwest Disney world. This is one of the key people. Uh, his name was Sierra, who was plant manager, and I worked quite a bit with him. I, I made two trips out here, and another one in 1980, and uh, he was extremely helpful in, in developing this. You can't imagine, book publishing is so less complicated now. But all the, all the pictures, and there I am with that old engine. And uh, again, coming back. As I say, now, um, Amtrak had this train, I think they call it the Southwest Limited, which runs over what was the Santa Fe's main line from Chicago to Los Angeles. Uh, it had been in the heyday of the railroad, the famous super chief, one of the most famous trains in America. I understood that um, Amtrak was, didn't do it well. Santa Fe would not let them use the word super chief. Well, after I left Walsworth, I went to St. Louis, but made a few stops. Uh, Don Walsworth had gone to the University of Missouri, Omazoo which is in a town called Columbia. 
and he wanted me to see the campus. So company chauffeur drove me from Marceline to Columbia, toured the campus, had lunch, it was getting dark. These columns had been some early building which burned down, but because they were stone, the columns survived. Now they make me think of the four stacks that are left of the 120 mill down the street, the sort of symbols of the area. Well, they got me to um, Independence, which is the capital of Missouri, and I spent a couple of days there on my own. The state capitol is there. Uh, it's an extremely handsome classical building, which I had great fun touring while I was there and the statue of Thomas Jefferson. Of course, we celebrate the Jefferson uh, Purchase, Louisiana. Also inside was a very handsome statue of guess who? Harry Truman, <laughs> which you could expect in Missouri. But it was a very handsome building and I enjoyed the, the stay, the couple days I spent in Jefferson City. All the more so later on when I went on the Pennsylvania State Capital Preservation Committee and developed an even greater appreciation for the, this sort of architecture. Really a monumental structure. That was the governor's mansion, a Victorian affair, which was the residence of, and I guess still is, of the governor of Missouri. Well, I went on to the last stop of this tour to St. Louis. Charming little railroad station in Jefferson City, and here comes the Amtrak train. Much of the trip was along the Missouri River, rather picturesque, rather pleasant. Down the river, which of course flows into the Mississippi just above uh, St. Louis. So here we are. Couple little small stations along the route where we stop. Some of, these, some of these old railroad stations are charming. Well, Skip, you gave me that wonderful book that depicts all of these. Arriving in St. Louis, which is rather depressing. I think the railroad station had been a toolbox or tool. And in the background there, you see the shed of the old Union Station. Now, unlike Chicago, which had six or eight great railroad stations, St. Louis had most of it in one great grand railroad station, which happily still exists, although it's no longer a railroad station. We'll talk a bit more about it, but that was the back end of the railroad shed. Okay, there's the symbol of Lucan's in Missouri, uh, the arch, which um, I've forgotten. What year was that? Skip, do you remember what year? Is that when it was, Rich? Well, I was staying in a hotel right near the riverfront and had a view from my window of this, and there it is. And yes, I did ride to the top of it. Uh, getting up to the top of that thing is a rather interesting ride. Uh, they have a group which look like a series of capsules, which hold maybe four or five people. And you hope the thing doesn't break up while you're in it. You, it's really tight. When you get to the very top, you get out of this capsule and there's a sort of slanted walkway. And you walk across the very top and there's these tiny, tiny little slits of a window. But you're like 650 feet in the air, so the vistas are quite impressive. And this was a view from my hotel window. Some people think when the sun hits it, it turns gold in the sun. And some people have wondered if it was the executive Headquarters for McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> the Golden Arches. Well, where's the other one? Yeah. Well, we're going to build two. We're going to build one. That's right. But right underneath it, right underneath it is a very historic structure. Um, it was the early Catholic cathedral, the first, I think, built west of the Mississippi. And uh, while the arch was impressive, I was not impressed uh, with what they did. This whole area along the river was cleared. It was desolate. Of course, again, business history, transportation history. St. Louis got its fame as a river town. And in the throes of redevelopment, they cleared almost all of the riverfront, all the historic buildings, uh, which was like Philadelphia cleared away Society Hill. And, and it was a shame because that was really the historic 
but it was considered, oh, they're Victorian, they're factory buildings, so it's all gone. The cathedral was too important historically, or it might have gone. Then there was this god-awful highway, like eight lanes, that you had to cross over to get over to this area. Is that, in fact, is that a train bridge back there? Is it? <laughs> yes, it is. I'm going to talk about that very clearly. Uh, this is the cathedral, and uh, this was uh, started by Laclede. Now, the big name in St. Louis is Laclede, who was the French explorer who started the village. I think his first name was Pierre. But one of the recent popes, I think John 23rd, rechristened this as the Cathedral of St. Louis, which is where the name comes from, King Louis IX of France. And there it is. And you can see the arch right behind it. Well, since the river really gave St. Uh, Louis its beginning, uh, I started touring around St. Louis, the waterfront, which I found desolate, very bad. There were a couple of, of, of steamers. Um, one was a restaurant where I remember going for dinner a couple of nights. But the big thing is this bridge. It's called Eads Bridge, E-A-D-S. Now here we're going back to the 19th century, the 1850s, 60s, the railroads are moving farther and farther west. The Pennsylvania Railroad, which after reaching to Pittsburgh, started buying up small railroad lines in the west. One which became the Fort Wayne Division, which got them to Chicago. And the other one was through further south, called the Panhandle Division, which got them to St. Louis. Okay, um, the West is developing, the railroads want contact, you have to get across the river somehow. Uh, the Mississippi is wider here and deeper, and other bridges were being built further north. Well, along comes this man whose name is Eads, E-A-D-S, James Eads, some distant cousin, I believe, of James Buchanan, our president. He was not an engineer, but he was, a, he was uh, in various businesses, uh, was a financier, had all sorts of ideas, and saw the future of having railroad here. The railroad had to get to St. Louis uh, because the, um, the development was there. And of course, the idea of trains coming was fought by the people who operated riverboats. This was competition. They didn't want this. So a great deal of study went into building this bridge. And Eads was the mastermind for it, really. And first of all, he had been in a business which did um, dredging, wrecks and so forth. So he knew the river, he knew what the flow was, he knew what the currents were, and he knew how da dangerous it was. So as this was being planned, Eads insisted that the, the uh, piers had to go very deep into bedrock to be safe, which is why the bridge is still here. Then he rejected some of the ideas of just a simple truss and did these arches. He also rejected the idea, the original engineer said, well, steel isn't good enough yet, it's got to be iron. And he said, no, no, steel is the coming thing. And of course, the Pennsylvania Railroad was very interested in this. And Tom Scott, who had worked with Carnegie, um, they were interested in selling steel for this. And I believe Carnegie Corporation did. But thanks to Eid, yes, the piers were deep, and yes, it was built of steel, and also they did these arches. The center arch, I think, is like 500 feet long, uh, which was its time, this thing opened in 1874, uh, and it was built with two levels uh, for railroad and these massive stone approaches uh, to raise uh, the tracks high enough to get to the upper levels because you had to clear the river boats. To me, this was one of the most significant things I saw in St. Louis. And it's still very much used. Well, I started to get deeper and deeper. I got away from my disappointment with the riverfront being cleared. Uh, one of the landmarks is the old courthouse, neoclassical building, now surrounded with my uh, major glass <coughs> skyscrapers. It's a museum. It was here that the Dred Scott, <coughs> famous Dred Scott case was held, you know, in which the Judge Roger Taney um, said that blacks couldn't vote, all the very huge controversy to help bring on the Civil War. 
and um, some of the columns. And I love fussing around and getting these reflections of the dome of this into this glass building right behind it. This is the uh, city hall, a very monumental, heavy, sort of French castle style. And it uh, happily was preserved. Now initially, uh, I found that um, St. Louis, having cleared away the waterfront, wasn't terribly interested in historic preservation. Uh, and some very big fights took place out there. This is a statue of Laclede, who is considered the founder of the city. Some major architectural fights took place over preserving various buildings. This one caught my eye. This is called the Wainwright Building, done by Lewis Sullivan who is considered a major figure in American architectural history. This came close to being bulldozed, but with opposition, happily was saved. Another building that was a huge fight was the post office. And the architect was Mullet, who mostly did work for the United States government. And he did post offices. A great one in New York and another one in Philadelphia were long gone. This was one of the last of his post office buildings. And after a huge fight, it was finally saved. Probably his most famous building is the one in Washington, now known as the old executive office building uh, on the uh, west side of the White House. Originally built to be the State Department and the Navy Department and now happily preserved. For decades, people wanted to knock it down, terribly Victorian, like Philadelphia City Hall, but if it survives, it's eventually considered a great landmark. This was the Mullet Post Office. However, as I continued hiking around the city, I found buildings that were great. This is the old railroad station, Union Station. One of the grandest, most monumental I think I've ever seen. But after all the railroad died, uh, it was saved and it uh, was turned into a hotel, mall, shopping center, civic center. And it's one of the great sights of St. Louis to see this. The tower alone is fantastic. See, in the old days, the railroads built these grand stations. And when you arrived in some city, you felt that you had arrived in an important place. Classic example is New York's Pennsylvania Station, which is gone. But the ornamental ironwork that was just put in light standards, and it's all been beautifully restored. This is the Union Station. And out front is this rather famous uh, fountain group, which symbolizes the joining of the Missouri River and the Mississippi. And I think they call it the fountain of the two, the two rivers. Quite a sight. And liking fountains, I was fascinated with this thing. Well, out a bit further, uh, not in the far western, is an area known as Forest Park. Uh, on the fringe of it are what once were rather handsome houses. Sort of run down when I was out there, but still very good. This building is called the Jefferson Memorial. Probably the most famous thing that ever happened in St. Louis was the famous World Fair in 1904 celebrating the, the um, uh, anniversary of Jefferson's purchase. There was a famous song, Meet Me in St. Louis Louis, which was generated by that fair. Well, this is called the Jefferson Memorial, and it's filled with historical data. The Missouri Historical Society has it, and yes, another statue of Jefferson. I spent a lot of time going through it. It was very impressed, and a lot of souvenirs of Lindbergh, who first crossed the Atlantic successfully. And there's also a very handsome uh, art museum. I didn't bring any pictures. I don't remember I took pictures of it, but it looks like Penn Station, very great monumental. Designed by um, Cass Gilbert, the Midwest architect. 
And in front is this great statue of St. Louis, King Louis IX of France. No, I wasn't drinking when I took that picture. I didn't get a double exposure, but I took it from a window in the museum and somehow the light picked up the window from the far end of the Grand Hall. But I like the picture for its oddity. <laughs> okay, we're just about to the last, I think we have what, one more reel here. Okay. Well, two places that were highlights of my time in St. Louis, which impressed me enormously. First was the campus of Washington University. When Washington University grew and wanted a new campus further west, they went to the west side of this forest uh, park. They staged an architectural competition for the design of the campus. And the winners were our Philadelphia boys of Cope and Stewartson, yeah. who became so famous for developing the collegiate Gothic style of architecture. First at Bryn Mawr, then at Penn, and then at Princeton. So when these people had this architectural competition, Cope and Stewartson went into it against very heavy competition, McKim, Meade, and White, Cass Gilbert, and others, but they won and we were commissioned to design buildings and to lay out the whole campus. So Washington University is a great symbol of Cope and Stewartson, which is meaningful to us because of our Greystone Mansion, which was built at the time that they were developing this style. And uh, this is a highlight of the trip, and I'm thinking, good Lord, it's Princeton out west. And it's exactly the same sort of architecture that you see at Princeton. And there it is. And loving Cope and Stewartson in this period, I had a great day there just meandering around, looking at all this, open mouth, couldn't believe to find this out in the Midwest. Of course, Cope and Stewartson uh, died at early ages, and uh, other architects and other schools copied and, and were inspired by all of this, with the result that uh, there are many, many places, many schools, who have buildings in this style that were developed by Cope and Stewartson. It really reminded me of Princeton so heavily, and I had this beautiful day there hiking all around the campus. Of course, like a lot of colleges in later years, they went in for modern things, although I understand in recent years, like Princeton, they've gone back to building in somewhat collegiate Gothic style. Cope and Stewartson both died at early ages. Um, Stewartson uh, drowned in the Schuylkill. He was somewhat athletic and he was on a, I think a uh, ice skating and misjudged the light and went under. Walter Cope was uh, very much in um, the light when this building was built. Of course, here they went into Georgian. But he died, I think in 1902, 1903, shortly after this building was planned. But the firm continued uh, for some years, and then later on it was Stewartson and Page, and the back end of this building was done by Stewart and Page. But this is uh, Washington U, and the same thing, all these arches and pathways, and there we are. Considered a very fine school, I understand. Duplicating this kind of stonework today would be just so expensive. But there it is. I was thrilled. This is one of the, one of the most beautiful things in St. Louis, and I really enjoyed it. Okay, now we're going to move on to another point of interest that I loved called the Missouri Botanical Gardens. The house that you see here was called Tower Grove, built in the 1840s by a man named John Shaw. 
Shaw was a merchant prince. He had various hardware and dry goods stores, made a substantial fortune. And by the time he was 40, he made enough money to retire and built himself this house, which he called Tower Grove. And it, it's an unusual house that has this sort of Italianate tower. And he wanted a good view, as I understood the story of, of the gardens, which he began, and which I believe he called the Missouri Botanical Gardens. Interesting house, still maintained, uh, with nicely furnished, much of it was his furnishing. That little bay was his office, which he had. And uh, he lived here until he died, I think somewhere in the 1870s. Never married, bequeathed the property and his financial estate to St. Louis, which has maintained it. I, and uh, of course the endowment didn't reach and I think other monies had to be uh, done. So he built this little mausoleum on the grounds and he planned and he was buried here under the statue. So this is John Shaw's monument and his great contribution to his city, which he obviously loved. Now the gardens grew beyond what he did and it's one of the great show places of the Midwest. And this is the entrance to the garden, 1858 when he established it. Some of its open land, uh, little ponds, some of its Japanese style gardens. And I'm told it's one of the largest Japanese gardens in the country. This building was fascinating, a sort of orangery. Uh, I'm told it's the first one of this sort built west of the Mississippi. Very handsome. And I think the statue is of Linnaeus, who was a famous uh, 19th or 18th century gardener. And it was just beautiful. I loved it. Hiked through it. Spent a whole day here. Very well done. Some nice Victorian ironwork. And there we are. Now a high point of the garden is this geodesic dome structure. Uh, considered one of the largest ever built anywhere. And here it is. It's a great greenhouse. Um, even I, who am not crazy about modern architecture, I thought I was impressed with this. I thought it was quite awesome. And the inside is a greenhouse. It's, it's a conservatory. This just caught my eye, a single bloom on a white column. And a lily pond in front of it, lily pads. Part of the Japanese garden. Beautiful rose garden. I thought it was superbly maintained. I hiked all over the place and I was very impressed with it. I like this flower pot with the ram's head since I was born in April. The Japanese garden, I understand, is the largest one in the United States, and certainly it was charming. Well, I'm going to conclude this downtown back to the riverfront. Start where you begin, or stop where you begin. Just north of Eads Bridge, there's a whole section called Laclede's Landing, which is supposedly where he first landed, which somehow miraculously escaped the redevelopment bulldozers. So when you go to the north side of Eads Bridge, you're in mid-19th century St. Louis, with a lot of old buildings that have been restored and kept. The atmosphere was beautiful. Uh, this was a restaurant. I remember having some, a couple of beautiful dinners in this area. I just loved it. So walking back downtown to the hotel from Laclede's, I'm walking under Eads Bridge with this great heavy stonework, which just impressed me so much. So while I'm walking, I caught this view of Sir Aaron's arch framed by an arch to the old bridge. 
And it just hit me. I wasn't a planned picture, it just hit me, and I had the camera. So I took that, and there's another one a little closer. And I'm gonna close this program with that picture, which brings back the 19th century architecture, the stone, and the modern 20th century. And as I opened it with a little vista of something associated with Lucan's, I'm closing it with that. So if you aren't asleep, I thank you for all coming, and I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>